Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Russia and China veto Western backed UN resolution on Syria for the third time. Iran condemns terrorism, slams Israeli accusations as baseless. And Hezbollah vows continued resistance to Zionists justifying loyalty to Assad. Mosaic. World news from the Middle East begins now. Moscow and Beijing blocked the American, French and British project for the third time at the UN Security Council in defense of the Syrian regime. UN envoy Kofi Annan is disappointed since at this critical time the Security Council has been unable to unite and take the strong and organized action that Annan is calling for. When it comes to the Russian and Chinese vetoes, the third time's a charm. Their firm position in support of the Syrian regime stands and has toppled the American and British project that aims to impose sanctions on the regime. For the third time, the Russian and Chinese challenge changed the direction of the attack on Syria towards Russia. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. considered it shameful for the U.N. Security Council not to seek a solution to Syria's crisis. Russia and China's use of their veto rights the first two times was destructive. This time, their vetoes were even more destructive. We were and remain doubtful of the Syrian regime's intentions and the efficiency of the U.N. observer's mission. This resolution refers to Chapter 7 to require the parties to implement their obligations to stop the violence, but it does not impose sanctions at this point, and it does not pave the way for foreign military intervention. It was meant to endorse Annan's plan. France and Britain directed their accusations against Moscow through their ambassadors at the Security Council. UN envoy Kofi Annan must be provided with all tools necessary to implement his plan, but there are restrictions on his mission. The third veto against the resolution on Syria means that there will not be any consequences for the regime and no sanctions to stop its horrific path. The United Kingdom resents Russia and China's veto. The two countries do not bear their responsibilities before the international community. Rather, they place their interests ahead of the interests of the Syrian people. The Syrian response to all the countries that attacked the regime was to consider the consensus built by the Security Council on combating terrorism as mere ink on paper, and it accused the Council of failing to support the political solution and of deceiving public opinion and restricting Anand's plan. For those of you who sincerely or insincerely sympathized with the terrorists and gunmen in Syria, it would be preferable to host them in your countries and provide them with the freedom to bear arms that they seek and the freedom to spread corruption, destruction and sabotage of the national fabric and the foundation of the state in Syria under the slogan of accomplishing democracy and demanding reforms. Mr. President, the recent recurring talks in the media on chemical weapons and Syria's intention to use them are completely false, and we consider them fishing in troubled waters. If these talks indicate one thing, it is that they point to the intentions of those who want to use chemical means and materials against our safe people. Al Jafri confirmed that those who deceived the Arabs with the Sykes Pico Agreement, the Balfour Declaration, and opened a wound in Palestine, invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, and supported Israel cannot truly work in achieving the interests of the Syrians. Hello, welcome to World News here on Press TV. More details are emerging about Wednesday's bomb blast in Bulgaria that left seven people dead. Sofia says the bomber carried a fake U.S. ID card. Officials say the bomber was a blonde white man dressed as a tourist. The incident happened in the Black Sea city of Burgas. Victims included five Israelis and a Bulgarian bus driver. The bomber was also killed. No group or individual has yet claimed responsibility for the incident. Israel's blaming Iran and the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah. 
Israeli Minister for Military Affairs, Ehud Barak, has even gone as far as vowing to retaliate. Tehran has condemned any act of terror in the strongest terms. The Iran's foreign ministry spokesman says Israel is the world's biggest sponsor of terrorism. Rami Memhan Parah says Tel Aviv is trying to divert the world's attention from its own terrorist activities by making baseless accusations against other countries. We spoke to Lebanese University Professor Mohsen Saleh about the matter. Let's take a listen at what he had to say. The Israelis know what they have done. They assassinated uh, uh, scholars and scientists uh, in Iran, in Tehran, through their uh, uh, agents or through their conspiracies with some parties like the United States and other European countries, probably. And that's why they, they feel they, they are uh, in, in the corner. That's why they are saying they they attacking or they saying that Iran or Hezbollah or Hamas or Jihad Islami, of course, Hamas or Jihad Islami or Hezbollah, they uh, never, never attack the Israelis outside the battlefield. I, I guess the Israelis now, they really don't know what to do because, uh, as, uh, as I said, many peoples in Bulgaria, in Europe and other places uh, are anti-Israel. The Sayyid of the Resistance in Lebanon gave a speech on the sixth anniversary of the great victory. Sayyid Nasrallah promised the occupation new surprises in case of another war. The surprises of July shocked the occupation. As for upcoming surprises, they will inevitably lead to its defeat. It is impossible to defeat the party of the resistance. It is destined to resist until victory. In the same way it produced victory in the past, it is capable of producing an even greater one in the upcoming confrontations. Syria has supported the resistance, and it is being targeted now as punishment. The war on Syria aims to destroy it, not to reform or change it. أكد الأمين العام لحزب الله سيد حسن نصر الله جهوزية المقاومة في لبنان لأي مواجهة Hezbollah's Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah confirmed the resistance's readiness in Lebanon in the face of any possible confrontation with the Israeli occupation, promising surprises. Sayyid Nasrallah said during a speech on the sixth anniversary of the July War in 2006 that the resistance is monitoring the occupation's movements night and day and is aware that the occupation is collecting information about Hezbollah in an anticipation of launching the first strike as it has in all previous wars. He confirmed that the quantitative weight operation was more akin to quantitative illusion and that the occupation will be surprised when it launches its first strike, vowing a great surprise. The Secretary General stressed that the most important message of the July War and later the Gaza War is that their destiny is victory, not defeat. Similar to 2000 and 2006, the party is able to produce an even greater victory in any future war. Said Nasrallah revealed for the first time that weapons used by the resistance in July and the rockets that fell on Haifa and beyond were provided by Syria and that Syria was jeopardizing its interests and leadership for the sake of the resistance by providing it with weapons while Arab regimes were preventing food and money from being transferred to Gaza. He clarified that Syria today is paying the price for its support of the resistance as some insist on rejecting reform plans and dialogue since the objective is to destroy Syria's army and people. He explained that the Syrian the Syrian army is the sole ideological army that remains in the region after they got rid of the Iraqi army. He pointed out that the Syrian opposition, even its patriotic parties, rejects dialogue because reform is not the demand. Rather, the destruction of Syria, the destruction of its people, and the fragmentation of the country is the goal the same way it was in Iraq. And that goal would have been accomplished had it not been for the resistance. Saudi religious scholar Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr is on a hunger strike despite being continuously tortured by security forces inside the prison. Saudi Arabia's Eastern Center for Human Rights expressed concern over the news reported by al-Nimr's relatives that he's being tortured by security forces after getting arrested on July 8th. He is also on an open-ended hunger strike. The center said that al nimr's relatives visited him and saw signs of severe torture, such as bruises on his face and eye. In addition, his front teeth have been removed. The center clarified that al nimr has been on an open-ended hunger strike since his arrest. 
He is being force-fed with a tube, and his hands are tied and cuffed as he lies injured on a hospital bed in the military prison in Dahran, indicating that his relative's visit was the result of an invitation from the authorities. This was done to assure his supporters that he is alive in order to prevent public uproar. The military court in Tunisia sentenced former President Zine al Abidin Ben Ali to life in prison. Judge Hadi al Airani said the verdict issued against Ben Ali came after he was convicted for complicity in the killing of 43 protesters during the revolution that toppled his rule. The judge added that the trial included 40 figureheads from Ben Ali's regime, among them Ali Sirati, the former head of presidential security, who was given a 20-year prison sentence. His former interior minister, Rafiq Belhash Qasim, was sentenced to 15 years, and Ahmed Fria was acquitted. On the other hand, the victims' families expressed anger over the light verdicts. National and youth movements and associations inside the Green Line in Israel have started holding events to urge Arab youths to refuse the national service that the Israeli government is attempting to impose on Arabs. Arab youths confirm the rejection of the service, seeing that it represents a form of military service under an authority that seizes their rights and land. Preserving Palestinian heritage, identity and land is the message sent by thousands of Arab youths inside the Green Line to the Israeli government that is trying to impose national service on them. Their message is also that no preconditions can be set to people's rights, which must be granted equally to Arabs and Jews. Youth movements and associations have started organizing events and festivals to explain the Israeli authorities' motives behind imposing national service on them. Fida is a woman of draft age. She hails from the Druze sect that was forced to perform military service. She refuses to serve because she has experienced horrors. There's this illusion that Israel is trying to make us believe that by serving in the military we will be granted our rights. What rights are we granted? Our land is being seized, our culture and education level are plummeting. Which rights are we talking about? None. Women's rights are even worse. This is nothing but an illusion. Youth movements confirm that Israel will not impose military service on them in fear that they will not demonstrate absolute loyalty to the Israeli army during wars and the attempts to occupy more Palestinian land. Also, they fear that Israel's security will be harmed if Arabs were to learn how to operate weapons. They assure that Israel will set military service as a condition and gateway to obtaining rights, which they believe will not happen. It makes no sense for us to serve in our cities and towns. We already serve in our cities and towns. But our service in those cities and towns is not related to the Israeli state and the Israeli state's institutions. Those institutions have never cared about us, served us, or worked in our interests. We do not work for their interests. I will not serve because, first of all, I'm Arab and I'm proud of my Palestinian identity. And of course, the Palestinian cause is not over for us as Arabs and as a minority in this state. There are 1.5 million Palestinians inside the Green Line. Their land is being seized, their villages are being encircled by Jewish neighborhoods, and their homes are being demolished under the pretext that they lack a permit. Even more frustrating is the rising unemployment rate. The Arab youths inside Israel say their mobilization against racist policies has begun. Policies that extend beyond confiscating their land, erasing their identity, and imposing obligations on them without granting them any rights in exchange. So the time has come. Jivar al Buderi, Al Jazeera, An Nasira. The death of Omar Suleiman, the former Egyptian vice president, was announced today from the United States. Hussein Kamal, Suleiman's aide, said that the former vice president died in a hospital in the American city of Cleveland. His death occurred suddenly while he was undergoing medical exams. He added that arrangements are being made to transport Suleiman's body to Egypt, where he will be buried. Suleiman was the head of the intelligence services for a long time during the era of the former regime until Hosni 
Mubarak appointed him as his vice president during the protests last year. Suleiman left Egypt after he was disqualified from the presidential race in the country's first post-revolution presidential election. The Egypt that transitioned to a new era did not avoid the circle of conflict, especially between the executive and judicial institutions. Today, the administrative court decided on the fate of the appeal over the dissolution of the constituent committee that was tasked with drafting the Constitution. The court ruled that it lacks the jurisdiction to look into the constitutional declaration that was issued by the Military Council. The court also discussed President Mohamed Morsi's decree to reinstate Parliament after it was dissolved. The court decided to postpone the case to a later session to enable a number of lawyers to respond to the court's request. News, some 250,000 people mourn the death of Rabbi Yosef Shalom El Yeshiv, the leading rabbi of the Ashkenazi non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodox community at his Jerusalem funeral last night, following his death yesterday afternoon at the age of 102. IBN's Eli Wogelanter has more. The funeral procession for Rabbi Yosef Shalom El Yashiv set out from the rabbi's residence in Jerusalem's Me'a Sharim neighborhood and made its way to Har HaMenuchot Cemetery in Givat Shaul. In accordance with Eliashev's wishes, eulogies were not given during the funeral procession and ceremony, but psalms were recited by the mourners. The guiding force behind the ultra-Orthodox political parties, Eliashev had been suffering from congestive heart failure and was hospitalized since February at the cardiac intensive care unit of Shari Tzedek Hospital. Tributes for the man known as the preeminent rabbi of his generation flooded in from across the political spectrum. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed his great sorrow, saying Rabbi Eliashev's way was to love the Torah and humanity, to be self-effacing, and to maintain the sanctity of life. Ashkenazi Chief Rabbi Yonah Metzger also knew Eliashev personally and recently spoke about his method of learning. He learned, and his system was to learn alone. And always with the melodic. I came once to his house, it was in Purim, to bring him Mishlachmones, and the he, uh, he came to his daughter in Bayit Vagan, so his daughter had only two rooms. One room was the living room, and one room was the bedroom. So he sat n near the bedroom, inside, with a small uh, table, and he continued to learn Torah. In the other room, Puri, all the kids, the grandchildren, and all the families, and all, so many guests came to this. Uh, to 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 uh, to set to be part of the party of Purim, and you hear in the other room the melody of the le to learning Torah as it was in another world. As the leading figure in Lithuanian ultra-orthodox Jewry, Eliashev wielded a huge influence over the outlook and stance of the community toward contemporary issues within Israeli society. Eliashev made his first debut in national politics in 1988 when he accepted Rabbi Elazar Shach's invitation to serve as one of the leaders of Degel Torah, the party that Shach had just founded. He steered the party into coalition agreements with Prime Minister Ehud Barak in 1999, but later quit that government, and with Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's government in 2005. Rabbi Eliashev leaves behind five generations of his family. Eli Wogelanter, IBA News. Iranian university students gather near the UN office in the capital, Tehran, demanding an end to atrocities against Muslims in Myanmar. The students say the killing of innocent people in Myanmar is a reminder of the Israeli atrocities against Palestinians. They say once more the world is witnessing the indifference of the West and its media in the face of the massacre of Muslims in Myanmar. The students called on the UN and international human rights organizations to come to the aid of Myanmar's Muslims. They also called on people from different religions to take immediate action to help protect the victims. Myanmar a country with a bleak rights record in Southeast Asia. While the world's mainstream media displayed the country as a fledgling oasis for democracy, 
state-sponsored ethnic cleansing against Rohingya Muslims in western Myanmar is going unnoticed. Rohingyas form a Muslim ethnic minority living in Rakhine, a state in western Myanmar. They face religious and ethnic discrimination. The first Rohingya people arrived in Myanmar as early as the 7th century, but the Myanmar government refuses to recognize them as the country's citizens. Reports say some 650 people have been killed since late June in clashes in western region of Rakhine. 1,200 others are missing and 80,000 more have been displaced. Even the country's so-called democracy icon and the West's most favorite figure Aung San Suu Kyi has turned a blind eye to these atrocities. Ironically, days after receiving a Nobel Peace Prize, Suu Kyi told reporters she did not know if Rohingyas were Burmese. Myanmar's President Thein Sein says Rohingya Muslims must be expelled or sent to UN refugee camps. He has even topped his last solution with deportation as the ultimate way. But where to? Large groups of Rohingyas have already sailed to neighboring Bangladesh, with many dying in exodus. The Bangladeshi government considers them illegal migrants and deports them. And the UN Refugee Center says it will not help Rohingya Muslims, as it is not interested in creating more refugees. Cruelty toward the Rohingyas is nothing new. They have faced torture, neglect and repression in the Buddhist majority land since it achieved independence in 1948. The United Nations has described them as one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. Many Rohingya Muslims are denied of their basic rights, including education, employment and even freedom of movement. They are subject to forced labor, extortion and other coercive measures. Now there are rising concerns that starvation and diseases could ravage the Rohingya communities in the coming weeks. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.